Dead America, Portland Part 4 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 1 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 22 Zion stepped out of his apartment early in the morning. As the door clicked shut behind him, he looked up the dimly lit hallway towards the stairwell waiting for his eyes to adjust to the low light. The only source was from a mirror at the end of the hallway that had been positioned to reflect the sunlight from the outer wall. Really need to add some emergency lighting to the shopping list, he muttered as he began to walk. A few doors down, he stopped and smacked a door with the palm of his hand a few times. Yo, Calvin, we got work to do, brother, he called. He waited a moment, hearing low groaning and shuffling from inside. When his friend didn't come to the door, he smacked it again loudly, the sound echoing through the empty hallway. Don't make me come in there, he warned playfully. There was more shuffling and then muffled voices, which made his brow furrow. Zion turned the knob, cracking the door open. As soon as it was an inch aside, Calvin appeared, bracing his body against it to keep it from opening further. His hair stuck out in all directions, his face flushed, looking far more frantic than he usually was in the morning. Hey, Zion, man, he blurted. Can you give me, like, two minutes and I'll be out? His visitor stared him down suspiciously. Yeah, I can do that, he said slowly. But first, you gotta tell me who else is in here with you. What? Calvin asked, voice shrill. There's nobody in here. Zion narrowed his eyes. I heard voices. Calvin opened his mouth, freezing, presumably going over excuses in his head, but none that worked post-apocalypse, such as, I was just watching TV. After a few awkward moments of silence, he sighed and stepped aside. All right, you got me, he admitted, but it's not what you think. Zion smirked, which means it's definitely what I think. He quipped and moved into the apartment. There was paper and empty bottles everywhere, the picture of a perfect bachelor pad. As he entered the living room, he spotted Tori sitting on the couch, nose wrinkled in embarrassment. Her sandy hair was askew, sticking up on one side, and she pushed her glasses up her nose as she avoided his gaze. Morning, Tori, Zion greeted brightly. She chewed a fingernail. Oh, good morning, Zion, she babbled, still not looking at him. I was just getting ready to join the others in the parking garage. Well, we'll be down in a bit, he said gently, smiling and nodding. Look forward to seeing what you came up with. She nodded like a bobblehead. You won't be disappointed. She grabbed some papers from the coffee table and rushed out of the apartment, throwing a wild grin at Calvin on her way out. He shot her back a goofy smile and watched her leave, closing the door behind her. As soon as it was closed, Zion threw his arm around his buddy, shaking him. Hell yeah, get you some, player, he gushed. Calvin's face flushed crimson. It's not like that, he insisted. Oh, you ain't gotta be shy around me, his friend teased. Do you have any idea what a relief it is that I'm not gonna have to watch my sister whoop your ass for hitting on her one of these days? Calvin bristled. That's still on the table he said. Come on, man. Zion rolled his eyes. You can't tell me it ain't what it looks like. Pretty girl waking up in your apartment with hair like that? His friend shook his head and motioned for him to follow over to the couch. There were numerous papers strewn about across the coffee table, despite what Tori had taken with her. Is it safe to sit on that couch? Zion asked, eyebrow raised. Calvin scoffed. I'm telling you, man, it's not what you think, he insisted. They sat down, Zion playfully looking around for any messes he shouldn't be sitting on. As he got situated, Calvin rifled through the papers and pulled out what looked like engineering schematics of a truck. What the hell is this? Zion furrowed his brow. His friend held out the paper. It's what Tori and I were working on last night, he explained. Zion grabbed the drawing and inspected it, eyes roving over the badass vehicle with the reinforced front end, 
spikes, and several other bells and whistles. It was the perfect zombie-killing machine for the apocalypse. So, you're telling me that y'all spent the night drawing trucks? He asked, gaping. Calvin grinned wolfishly. Not just any truck, he said. It's my future battle truck. Zion blinked at him in confusion. Battle truck? He blurted. Hell yeah, a battle truck, his friend exclaimed, throwing up his hands. We're in the apocalypse, and it's about damn time we went all Mad Max with this. He leaned forward as Zion stared dumbfounded at the drawing, grabbing a joint from a little box on the corner of the coffee table and sparking it up. I ran into Tori at dinner last night, and we got to talking, Calvin explained as he puffed. She asked how Fingers was coming along with rebuilding my trucks, and then I made a joke about Mad Max, and then the next thing you know, she started throwing out ideas. After that, we came up here and started drawing stuff, and the time kinda got away from us. Zion chuckled, shaking his head. Man, I hope to God you aren't that oblivious when you're watching my back out there, he said. What do you mean? Calvin's brow furrowed. Come on, man, his friend said, tossing the paper on the table. You have a highly intelligent and cute girl talking about weaponizing your truck, and you didn't make a move? Calvin took a long drag on his joint and shook his head. I really didn't think she... Zion cut him off by smacking him on the back of the head. Lucky for you, we're in the apocalypse, so her pickings are slim, he said, pointing a playful finger in his friend's shocked face, so you might be able to get another chance. Wait, you think... Calvin trailed off, sitting with his joint smoldering away in his hand, forgotten. Hell yeah, I think she's into you, Zion confirmed with a nod. And I'm not just saying that to protect your well-being from my sister. His friend thought back to every moment from the night before, finally remembering his weed and taking another thoughtful few puffs, replaying each bat of Tori's eyelashes and brush of her fingers on his arm as they drew their blueprints. He finally scrubbed a hand down his face, groaning. Apparently I need to start having some coffee with dinner, he admitted. Because holy hell, how did I miss those signs? If you're interested, Zion replied playfully, I do teach a course for a totally affordable amount, he laughed. Calvin sighed, shaking his head. I'll keep that in mind. Come on, his friend said, smacking his knees and getting to his feet. Let's grab some breakfast and go see what your girlfriend has cooked up in the parking garage. Chapter 2 Zion and Calvin came out of the stairwell to the parking garage. Every truck and SUV had been moved against the far wall, and the cement floor was a disaster zone. There were car parts and bits of metal strewn around everywhere, tools and bins scattered about. This place looks like my brother's room growing up, Calvin declared. If my mama were here, somebody would be getting yelled at for sure. Zion opened his mouth to respond, but a loud metallic clang startled them. What in the holy hell was that? Calvin demanded, and they rushed into the thick of things, looking around. As they came around a large van, Jack, Missy, and Harold exchanged high fives while standing beside a tall metal structure on rollers. Zion raised an eyebrow. Looks like they built something fun, he said. He and Calvin wandered over, studying the contraption. It was six feet tall, with roughly welded patches of metal in the center. The top two feet had a dozen metal bolts about four feet long, points on the ends. At the back was a giant lever connected to the bolts, with five wheels along the bottom, like heavy-duty versions of office chair wheels. My, my! Zion piped up as they approached. What do we have here? Jack grinned, brushing his sweaty hair off of his forehead. Hey, you guys, you like what you see? He asked. That depends, Zion replied, cocking his head. I'm not exactly sure what I'm looking at. Missy spread her hands, presenting the object as if she were on a game show. I like to call this the Impaler 3000. Patent pending? Harold added. Calvin scratched the back of his head. Why do you call it 3,000? He asked. Because each spike is capable of reaching 3,000 PSI, assuming you have someone strong enough to work the lever, Missy replied. Zion eyed his companion with a smirk. 
Guessing she isn't talking to you, he joked, and there was a ripple of laughs throughout the group, Calvin included. So, walk me through it, he said, motioning to the contraption. Jack stepped forward, demonstrating as he spoke. It's simple enough, he explained. You just push it up to the concrete barrier and pull the lever as hard as you can. He pulled the lever slightly to the right before slamming it down, and all twelve metal bolts rocketed in between the metal railing above the concrete, all of them hitting around head height with a deafening crack. Calvin crossed his arms. Didn't look like you pulled the lever that hard, he said. Hell, I'm pretty sure I can hit three thousand myself. Jack smirked and shook his head, grunting as he strained to lift the lever back up to the top. As he moved up, it clicked into place in the notches. He gave up a few from the top. Need a hand with that? Zion asked. Jack shook his head and stepped back from the machine. Nah, it's all good, he replied. We still need to make a few minor tweaks to the springs. So, it's a spring-loaded death machine? Zion asked, a wide grin forming on his face. I was wondering why you had those on the shopping list yesterday, Calvin mused, wagging his finger at the students. You guys found a lot of them, Missy declared, smiling triumphantly. Enough to build four or five more of these. Harold rubbed the back of his neck. But we still need a few smaller parts to complete them, he admitted. Just put them on the shopping list and we'll see what we can do this afternoon, Zion suggested. Missy cocked a brow. I thought you were doing a run this morning, she asked. He shook his head. Sorry, but Wendy called in last night and we have to go help them out first, he replied. Oh, okay, she said, nodding. That gives us time to work out everything we're going to need for the lopper. Zion and Calvin exchanged a glance, saying in unison, The lopper? The college kids grinned and Jack motioned for them to follow him. They walked to the far corner of the garage next to an area completely bathed in sunlight. Tori sat on the ground tinkering with a small weed-eater-sized engine connected to a long six-foot handle that jettisoned out from the base. Above the engine was a metal post that was six feet high, with a trio of plastic arms sticking out of the top in a four-foot radius. Okay, I'm intrigued, Zion said, gaping at the machine. Tori looked up and regarded them, smiling warmly at Calvin. Hey guys, she said. Give me just a minute and I can give you a demonstration. Zion nudged his companion playfully as he looked down again, and Calvin blushed, wrinkling his nose. They approached the machine and Zion flicked one of the thin plastic arms jetting out from the center. Not sure if this is going to do a whole lot of damage, he mused. Tori shook her head. Well, this is more of a proof-of-concept prototype, she replied. Wanted to make sure the concept was sound before we sent you two out shopping. All right, Zion agreed. So what does it do? The blonde held up a finger signifying she needed a minute. She finished tinkering with the engine and then primed it. You may want to take a step back, she warned. It won't kill you, but might leave a mark. The duo took a few steps back, waiting with bated breath. Once they were clear, Tori pulled the ripcord and the engine sprung to life. She moved back to the handle that stood at her waist with a motorcycle throttle attached to the right side. You ready? she asked. Zion gave her a thumbs up and she hit the throttle. The center metal rod began to spin rapidly and the plastic arms whirled like a helicopter. It started to move so fast that they were barely visible. The audience nodded appreciatively, impressed. Jack, the can, Tori called over the loud engine. Jack looked down and grabbed an empty soda can from a pile on the ground next to his feet and then lobbed it at the blades. The machine shredded it into pieces, sending debris flying against the back wall. Tori grinned as she flicked the power off and turned back to the duo. If that can was any indication, I'd say your little test worked, Zion declared, holding up a hand. The blonde nodded vigorously. Yeah, I'm pleased with it, she agreed, pushing her glasses back up her nose. Although I think the Impaler 3000 should be our priority. Why? Zion asked, brow furrowing. This thing looks like it could tear those bitches to shreds. Tori tilted her head back and forth. Don't get me wrong, this thing will do the job when the time comes, she assured him. However, it's going to be heavy, 
like it will take three of us to move it into position heavy. Which means, Harold added, for it to be effective, we're going to need a horde to be headed in our direction. And even then, it's just going to thin some of them out, Missy piped up. Zion crossed his arms thoughtfully. Still, if you make it heavy duty enough, it could help out. What would you need to make a real one of those? Calvin asked. We have most of the main components, Tori replied. The metal and blade components, anyway. We even have the gas. Zion cocked his head. But? We need engines, the blonde finished. The weed-eater engine I used on the test isn't going to pack enough punch. Calvin pursed his lips for a moment. So, what are you thinking? he asked. Go-karts? I was thinking, Tori replied. Riding lawnmower engines? She held up her hands as the duo shared a concerned look. I would have thought those would be plentiful, she quickly added. I can't imagine too many looters targeting those. Zion nodded. Problem is, they're out of season, so a lot of smaller stores stopped carrying them, he pointed out. There's always that super garden center in the mall, Calvin suggested. His companion shook his head. That mall is a clusterfuck and a half, he replied. I thought you were luring zombies away, Jack piped up. Why not just do the same there? he asked. We tried, Zion explained, and we were only able to get the ones outside to follow. The ones inside just didn't want to come out the doors, and I sure as shit wasn't going to play doorman for them. So we just locked them up inside. Tori nodded, pushing her glasses back up on her nose. It's okay, she assured him. I'll see if I can come up with a workaround. Although, when we're out raiding, I'll keep an eye out for some, Calvin said quickly. Never know what we're going to find. She smiled, eyes lighting up as she regarded him. Just write down everything you need, Zion said. We'll take care of it as best we can. Thanks, Zion, Tori said, and then her eyes flicked back to his companion. Thanks, Calvin. She shot him a little wink, and a goofy grin broke out on his face. We'll be back this afternoon, so have your shopping list ready, Zion said and led his swooning friend away. We need to get going. Yeah, Calvin added. You know how Wendy gets when we don't show up on time. Monique ain't much better, Zion added, and they shared a chuckle as they headed back across the garage. Oh, good. You two haven't left yet, Cheryl called as she emerged from the stairwell. Zion waved to her. What's up? Just got a call from the cattle drivers, she replied, and they landed a big one. How many? he asked. She tucked a stray lock of hair behind her ear with a pencil. Their best guess was eight to ten thousand? Well, damn. Zion crossed his arms and smirked at his companion. Looks like they beat our record. Calvin clenched a fist in front of his face. We'll get him next time. Was there anything else? Zion asked. We were about to head out to Wendy's. I've already taken the liberty of letting her know you're going to be running a bit late due to the mob, Cheryl assured him. He nodded. They hit in the crossroads, I take it, he added. They're approaching the front edge of the crossing now, Cheryl informed him, checking her clipboard. The crossroads? Missy asked, the students having clustered behind them to listen. Where our roads meet the interstate, Cheryl explained. It's only a few miles down, so we pull everybody back from it to make sure it's as quiet as possible. Calvin grinned. Those critters are like lemmings, he added. You get one of them going one way and the rest of them follow. Oh, okay, Missy said, nodding. I get it. Thank you. How long until we can hit the back road? Zion asked. Cheryl held up a finger. Give them one hour and you should be good. Well, Zion said with a sigh. Since we have all this time on our hands, Calvin, maybe you can take Tori out for some breakfast. His companion raised an eyebrow. But we already... He stopped at Zion's wide-eyed stare and then continued. Told them we didn't have time today. So, Tori, we might have to wait a few minutes for them to make us something fresh. He stumbled over his words nervously. I mean, um, assuming you're free and all. She pushed her glasses up her nose and seemed amused by his nervousness. I would like that. Calvin's face lit up as she joined him. Just be down here in 45 so we can get prepped, Zion reminded him as they sauntered off together. Calvin didn't even break stride. 
giving a thumbs up over his shoulder as they left. Zion shook his head and chuckled under his breath. I swear that boy wouldn't get anywhere if he didn't have a wingman like me. There was a smattering of chuckles and he turned to the remaining trio of students. So, what are the sorts of crazy zombie-killing gadgets you guys come up with? Harold rubbed his hands together in excitement. Come on, let's show you our idea book. Chapter 3 Zion sat in his truck, loaded up and ready to go. He glanced in the side mirror, watching one of the guards fill up the tank with a gas can before setting the half-full can in the back. After a few moments, the passenger door opened and Calvin slid into the seat. There's the playboy, Zion declared with a grin. How'd your breakfast date go? His companion simply threw him a smirk. Just remember that Christmas isn't too far away, and your wingman likes weaponry. Zion said. Calvin winked at him. Tori and I will whip you up something nice then. Well, buckle up so we can get on the road, his friend replied with a laugh. Gotta get you back quick so your girl doesn't yell at me for keeping you out so late. Calvin chuckled as the truck roared to life, and Zion peeled out of the parking garage heading out down the driveway and towards the interstate. So, you gonna give me some details? Zion pressed. His friend blushed and shook his head, pulling out a joint from his pocket. Not much to tell, man, he admitted, and sparked it up. We just sat in one of the garden areas and drank coffee. Honestly, spent a lot of time just sitting quietly and enjoying the peacefulness. Uh-oh, Zion said. Calvin blinked at him, choking on his inhale. What do you mean, uh-oh? He asked through a fit of coughing. I really enjoyed myself. I don't know, man his friend replied, drawing out his words. You sure she was having a good time too? My sister's told me some horror stories about guys who couldn't hold a conversation. Calvin's eyes were wide as saucers. I mean, she put her head on my shoulder while we were sitting there, he said. I'd say that was a good sign, wouldn't you? Zion burst out laughing and smacked his friend on the arm. Man, look at you giving me the old okie doke he teased. You know exactly what you were doing, didn't you? Gotcha, Calvin replied with a grin and took a smaller puff from his joint. Well, I'm happy for you, man, Zion said. Glad you got a little romance brewing there. His companion let out a happy sigh on the exhale. Me too, he said wistfully. I know this is going to come as a shock, but even when times were good, I was never much of a ladies' man. No, Zion gasped dramatically. You don't say. Calvin rolled his eyes, fighting a smile. Shocking, I know. Well, make sure you treat her right, his friend instructed, because it's not like you can afford her. Calvin chuckled and shook his head. No shit, right? When they reached a mile within the interstate, there were half a dozen men standing in the road, and Zion sobered as one of them flagged him down. He pulled up and unrolled the window. What's going on? he asked. That mob of dead fuckers are still shambling by, the guard replied, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Calvin leaned over. What did they do? he asked. Stop and have a picnic? They should have passed by now. The guard shrugged. It's been moving steady for a while now, he said. So either those boys can't count or they picked up another group along the way. Either way, it's good that they're getting so many of these things out of here, Zion said with a sigh. Less we got to deal with, right? The guard nodded stoically. Yes, sir, Mr. Zion. So, any idea how much longer we need to camp out here? He asked. Because we got stuff to do. The guard pulled out his walkie-talkie, holding up a hand. Hang on, let me check. He lifted the radio to his lips. Hey, Bubba, you copy? He asked. Yeah, I'm here. What's up? Bubba came back. The guard raised a hand over his eyes, peering towards the interstate. How's the tail end of this thing looking? Last of them passed by the exit about five minutes ago, Bubba replied. The guard nodded. All right, you keep sitting tight till I tell you otherwise, he instructed. Ten four, Bubba replied, and the line clicked off. So, what's the verdict? Zion asked. The guard lifted a hand and tilted it back and forth. 
He's a ways down south, so you're probably looking at another hour or two before the last of the stragglers come through, he replied. Wonder if Tori is free for lunch, Calvin joked. The guard pursed his lips and cocked his head. If you don't mind a bumpy ride, I got an alternative for you. I'm listening, Zion replied, leaning out the window. The guard pointed past him. Go back up the road about half a mile until you see a dirt clearing in the trees, he said. It looks like at one time they were trying to put a mountain bike path for all those healthy fuckers that could afford to live in these parts. They didn't get much past the clearing stage, however. Is it drivable? Zion asked. The guard shrugged. As long as you got four-wheel drive, you're good. Anything else and you're going to get stuck, he replied. Zion patted the steering wheel. Covered. It's going to wind around a bit in spots, the guard admitted. But if you keep going, you'll hit a road just after a few miles. Just hang a left and you'll hit the interstate. Zion smiled and extended a fist. Appreciate the info. Any time, Mr. Zion, the guard replied, returning the smile and bumping his fist with his own. You two be safe out there. Zion nodded and rolled up the window, executing a quick three-point turn and heading back up the road. Here's hoping we got the bat out of the way today. Calvin said with a sigh as he stubbed out the end of his joint. His friend shook his head. Don't go jinxing us now, he said, and they shared a chuckle. Zion slowed to a crawl as they looked for the trail entrance. After a few moments, Calvin pointed to an opening in the trees. That's gotta be it, he said. Zion turned onto it, stopping at the entrance. Before them stretched a bumpy dirt path that was barely wider than the truck. Buckle up, he said. This ain't gonna be fun. Chapter 4 Zion and Calvin pulled up to the camp less than a mile from the bridge over the river. As they approached the neighborhood, there were a few groups of armed guards about, both men and women, patrolling the streets on foot. They waved at the vehicle as it rolled up towards the entrance, Man, they're really expanding down here, Calvin said as he waved back to the guards. Zion nodded. Talked to Monique last night for a bit, and she said they've taken over another two blocks since we were last here, he said. That's a hell of an expansion, Calvin mused in awe. Zion shrugged as he pulled in. Kind of necessary with the survivors they've been taking in, he explained. She said they found a family of ten yesterday and brought them in. Let me guess, his friend drawled. They have a shopping list for us? Zion cocked his head. She didn't say, she just said come down, he said, and drove through the eight-foot-tall iron gate across the center of the road. One of the door guards leaned in. Wendy and Monique are waiting for you at the house on the corner, he said, waving them through and then helping to close the giant gate. Zion nodded and drove on, parking the truck outside a large two-story brick house. As he killed the engine and they got out of the car, Wendy and Monique emerged from the house. You're late, little brother, his sister quipped. Zion shook his head. Cheryl said she'd let you know we were running behind, he said. You're nearly half an hour late outside of that, Wendy added, crossing her arms. We had to off-road it a bit to get around the interstate horde, Calvin explained. Feels like I'm still bumping up and down even though I'm not moving. He shook out his arms a bit. So, what you got for us? Zion asked. Wendy turned towards the door and waved for them to follow. Why don't you come inside? She asked. We got some people we'd like you to meet. The duo headed up the porch steps and Monique and Zion embraced before they headed into the house. There was a Latino family sitting in the main foyer, looking like there were several generations of people ranging from four to eighty-four years old. A couple of the children were playing together in the corner under the watchful eye of a grandmother, while several adults sat around a table in the center playing a card game. Wow, Calvin said, blinking at the guests. Where in the world did you find them at? At their restaurant, about ten miles south of here, Wendy replied. She waved at one of the men, who looked to be in his mid-twenties. Mateo, can you come over here, please? she asked. He got up from the table. He was physically fit, but no bodybuilder, with dark hair and determined eyes. He extended his hand to Zion and Calvin in turn with a warm smile. Hello, gentlemen, 
he said with a slight accent, but a confident tone that said he'd been speaking English his entire life. I am Mateo. Zion nodded as they shook. I'm Zion, and this is my friend Calvin. Tell them what you told us, Wendy prompted. Okay, he began, taking a deep breath. My family, we have had this restaurant for years, and we got all of our supplies from a uh, family friend. He really wanted to help out people like him, so he would only sell to people he knew. Because of this, his place of business wasn't listed. No signs, no nothing. When you say supplies, you mean... Calvin prompted. Food, Matteo replied with a nod. Dried beans, massa flour, other staples with a long shelf life. Zion cocked his head. Where is this place? About ten miles south of here, Matteo replied. Calvin nodded. Could be worth checking out, he said, and grinned at the corner inhabitants, especially with some old-school grandma cooks. That's why we called you, Wendy piped up. We could send some of ours from here, but they're worn out from clearing the block over the past few days. Monique winked at her brother. And we know how much you love bashing in skulls, she said. What kind of sister would I be if I didn't look out for my kid brother? Zion chuckled. Thanks, sis. So, you'll go? Matteo asked, hope in his eyes. Yeah, we'll go check it out, Zion replied. Their new acquaintance clapped his hands. Wonderful, he exclaimed. Let me get my things, and I will join you. Slow down, bud, Zion said, putting up a hand. Calvin and I can handle this. Just tell us where to go. Matteo's brow furrowed. You can use my help, he insisted, and my guidance to the warehouse. Can you fight? Calvin asked. Look around this room, Matteo said and spread his arms. Do you see anybody that looks capable of handling themselves against the dead, other than myself? The duo scanned the room, scrutinizing the rest of the family, not seeing anyone they would really want to put out in battle. Guess not, Zion admitted. I am the reason my family is alive, Matteo declared, and I would like to be a part of the reason the people who took us in make it through the winter. Calvin held up his palms in surrender. I have one very important question for you, buddy, he said. Yes? Matteo cocked his head. If we get this stuff, Calvin began taking a deep breath. Can someone here make me some tamales? I've had a craving for weeks, he patted his belly. The group chuckled and Matteo grinned. I guarantee it will be the best you ever had, he assured him. Calvin nodded. All right, I'm sold. Zion chuckled. Go on. Get your stuff and meet us outside. Matteo nodded and ran off, and Monique took Zion's arm, pulling him out onto the porch. He looked around the street, seeing dozens of people milling about in the open, looking casual, happy even. Amazing the difference a few weeks makes, huh? she asked. Zion nodded, but took a deep breath. Those things coming over the bridge still concern me, but I think you're in a great spot here, sis. We wouldn't be anywhere close to this built up if it wasn't for what you're doing, little brother, she said, running a hand over the back of his neck. He wrinkled his nose. Really wish you wouldn't call me that, he muttered. Baby brother it is, then, Monique teased. He put up a hand. Little brother is fine, he said. She chuckled. So are things going well at the complex? she asked. Everybody seems to be happy, Sion said and we got those college kids ramping up our defenses. She smiled. Well, tell them once they get you squared away, we wouldn't mind borrowing them for a bit. I think that can be arranged, Sion replied with a nod. Calvin, Wendy, and Matteo emerged from the house, the latter wearing a makeshift holster with two blades dangling on either side. Zion raised an eyebrow. Those are your weapons? he asked. Matteo pulled out one of the glittering blades, at least a foot long with a slight curve. Butcher quality. Cuts through bone like butter, he declared, especially those of the dead that have begun to rot. If it works for you, I'm all for it, Zion replied with a nod. Let's load up. He gave Monique's shoulder a squeeze and led his men to the truck. He opened the door and let Matteo clamber into the middle seat. If you want to clear it out and do a brief inventory, Wendy said from the steps, I can send some of my guys down tomorrow to finish clearing it out. Zion nodded. We'll also load up what we can and bring it back, he assured her. Appreciate your help, she replied. He gave her a little salute. It's what I do. 
He threw his sister a smile who beamed back at him with pride. Chapter 5 The trio drove to a run-down neighborhood. There were bars on the windows, overgrown grass, and broken-down cars in the driveways. As they crawled along the street, there were a few zombies around the houses that shambled out of the side yards, attracted to the engine noise. It's about three more blocks up to the right, Matteo instructed. Just a regular brick building. Zion nodded. Shouldn't be too hard to find, he coasted up the road a few zombies reaching the asphalt and beginning to tail them. When they passed a few more intersections, Matteo pointed to a building at the end of the block. That's it, he exclaimed. There were a few dozen zombies around the building, a few pawing at the front door lazily like a kitten against a fish tank. Looks like someone was alive in there at one time, Zion mused. Matteo pursed his lips. Could be the owner and his family, he said. So, how do you want to play this? Calvin asked, rubbing his hands together. Zion glanced in the rearview mirror and watched the dozen or so zombies spread out and lumbering after them, though still about fifty yards away. Matteo and I will clear out the zombies in front, he said. Anything behind us gets to that last intersection, you put it down. Not a problem, Calvin replied. All right, Zion said, glancing at Matteo. Let's see what you can do. He cut the engine, and they slid out of the truck, quickly surveying the immediate area for threats. Other than the pack to their friend and the stragglers behind, there was nothing else coming out of the woodwork. Zion reached into the back seat, pulling out his makeshift two-by-four that Tori and her friends had crafted for him. The handle, covered in duct tape, still covered in dried blood on the business end. Calvin walked to the back of the truck, hopping up into the back, he knelt behind the tailgate, resting his rifle on top of it. He looked through the scope, getting a read on the closest zombie, what had once been a woman missing an arm. Looks like a zombie got a to-go order, he muttered to himself, and then shook his head at the groaner of a joke. He refocused, dialing in his sights, waiting for the zombie to cross the threshold up the block. As soon as its foot touched the intersection, he squeezed the trigger. Its head exploded in a satisfying array of blood, sending the body to the ground in a heap. He chambered another round and continued to wait, the next zombie about fifteen yards behind her. Easiest detail I've had in a while, he murmured, and then pulled back from his scope, checking his immediate left and right just to back up his claim. Nothing appeared to be drawn to the noise of his gun. Guess they're all at the warehouse, he said to himself. Meanwhile, the other two moved towards the horde, Matteo flinching as Calvin's first round went off. Don't go getting soft on me now, Zion said, and it was a joke, but the undertone had a hint of worry. Matteo shook his head. Sorry, he replied. Just been a while since I've heard gunshots going off close by. It's all good, Zion assured him. Just don't let it break your concentration. His companion nodded and pulled out his two blades from the holsters at his sides. One was the foot-long curved blade, and the other was a meat cleaver, both of them shiny and unbelievably sharp. As they walked up, a few of the zombies broke away from the building, attracted by the gunshots. The trio made it within fifteen yards before another shot cracked and more zombies turned towards the truck. Which one do you want? Zion asked. Matteo inclined his head. I'll take the trio, he said. Zion nodded, impressed at the bravado. Have at it, he said, waving his companion forward. Matteo walked up confidently to the trio of zombies, and the lead of the triangle lunged at him, clad in designer jeans and a tattered polo shirt. The living man went into a flurry of slashes, the cleaver taking off both of the creature's arms and the long blade slipping up through the ghoul's chin like butter. He pulled back on the blade and fell into a crouch as the two behind came forward, shoulder to shoulder. Matteo slashed at throat level, cutting deep into their necks, but not quite far enough to sever their heads. He flipped the cleaver around and attacked with the blunt end, coming across his body and catching the left zombie on the side of the head. The impact sent the head clean off its body from its weakened, severed neck and slammed into its partner, partially knocking the second zombie's head off. It fell to the ground and continued to moan and gnash its teeth as the head held on by a few tendons. 
Mateo jabbed down into its eye socket with a long knife, silencing it. Zion began a slow clap, shaking his head. My apologies on doubting you, sir, he said sincerely. A lot of people underestimate me, Mateo admitted, tossing him a smirk. Always fun to prove them wrong. Zion chuckled as he readied his weapon and stepped up next to his companion. Two more zombies approached, still a little ways ahead of the main horde of twenty or so that had broken off due to Calvin's firing. Hang tight, he instructed, holding up his weapon. I want to show you who you are partnered with. Mateo playfully extended his hand, presenting the duo of ghouls to Zion, who headed forward. He stopped about five yards away from the two monsters, who kept stride with one another. Zion put the large weapon on his shoulder like a bat, playfully pointing to left field like he was Babe Ruth calling his shot. When they got close, he swung with all his might, catching the creature on the side of the head and driving it through its partner. The blow partially disintegrated the zombie's head, sending a splatter of blood through the air. The corpse crashed down on top of its partner, trapping it for a moment. Zion stood over it and drove the tip of the weapon into its face, crushing it. Mateo playfully tapped his two metallic weapons together, praising his new friend. Impressive, he declared. However, I need to remember to keep a few feet back so I don't get caught in the backswing. Good call, Zion agreed. They looked towards the warehouse, seeing twenty-five or so creatures moving towards them, easily twenty yards away. The pack was fairly thick, with only a few feet between each group. So, what do you think? Zion asked, wiggling his weapon. I knock him down and you slice him up? Mateo readied his blades, flashing and glinting in the sun. Batter up, my friend, he said. Zion grinned and rushed forward towards the right flank of the creatures. He quickly reared back and swung hard, catching a zombie in the ribcage and sending it tumbling back into several others. He darted to the left, extending the two-by-four in front of him and ramming it into the center of a ghoul's chest and sending it back, staggering several more of its brethren and giving him room to tee up another swing. Meanwhile, Mateo ran up, his cleaver swinging upward and catching a fallen zombie struggling to sit up in the face. The blade created a thin slit all the way up through the skull, cutting the brain clean in half. He stabbed down with the long blade into the forehead of another fallen ghoul, and then immediately slashed the head off of another, with the cleaver in a deadly dance. As he stepped up to the next group, Zion swung mightily one more time, knocking down another four creatures. He stepped back and tugged on his companion's arm, pulling him lightly back towards the truck. Something wrong? Mateo asked. Nah, Zion replied, shaking his head. Just giving them a chance to break up a bit. We are a two-man wrecking team, but there's no sense in risking getting in over our heads. His partner nodded and backed up about ten yards. They waited patiently as the eight or so zombies on the ground staggered to get back to their feet, tripping up a few of their friends in the process. A few moments later, the horde of twenty had been broken up into smaller, more manageable groups. Let's clear this batch and do the same retreat, Zion suggested. You ready? Mateo nodded. Beat him down, he replied. The two of them worked in tandem for several minutes, systematically dispatching the threat. Zion stepped up to the last creature that was trying to pull itself off of the ground after falling. He swung the hunk of wood like a golf club, catching the ghoul underneath the chin and ripping the head clean off. As the head landed several feet away, he let out a chair and threw up his arms, celebrating the decent chip. Good distance there, my friend. Mateo said with a grin. Zion returned it as he turned around. Yeah, golf was never really my game, he admitted. But my sister did take me to the driving range a few times before all this. Did you enjoy it? Mateo asked. Oh, yeah, Zion said, nodding. Great way to let out frustration while still being competitive with the guy next to you. His companion chewed over the words. Never thought of it like that, he admitted. A few more shots rang out from behind them in rapid succession, and they turned towards the truck just in time to see Calvin hop down and head towards them. Okay, that's the last of the stragglers, the sniper announced. Doesn't look like anything else is too close by, at least not in numbers we need to worry about. Zion clapped him on the shoulder. Then let's hurry up and get what we need before that changes, he suggested. They headed briskly towards the building, hopping over corpses, and Calvin checked the front door first. 
He tried the knob, but it was locked. He shook the door a few times, a clanging metallic sound coming from the inside. Locked up tight, he said, stepping back, and sounds like it's chained too. Zion turned to Mateo. Is there a back entrance? he asked. There's a small loading dock in the back, his companion replied. Zion nodded and led the trio around the side of the building, slowing at the corner. He peeked around to make sure there was no gaggle of undead back there and saw the area empty. There was a four-foot-high concrete slab against the back of the building, and a metal rolling door that opened to the side. Calvin tried the door, but it was also locked. Ideas? he asked. Zion looked up at the horizontal windows above and motioned for the others to get out of the way. Once they were clear, he swung up with his weapon, smashing one of the panes of glass. Okay, he said. Which one of you wants to go? Mateo holstered his blades and raised a hand. I'll do it, he said. I know the layout in there, so if there is company, I know where I can go. Hell, I'm not gonna argue with that, Calvin quipped. Zion smirked at him. You just don't want to go. And, Calvin shrugged. Zion chuckled and laced his fingers together, creating a step for Mateo to vault upwards through the window. Get in and get the door open, he instructed. We'll sweep it together. His companion nodded and placed his boot into Zion's cupped hands. As the strong man boosted him up, he grabbed on to the edge of the window, careful to avoid jagged glass, and hooked a leg up into the frame. He rolled his body inside and then landed with a thud on the floor. You okay? Zion called from outside. Yeah, I'm good, Mateo replied, and looked around to make sure there were no threats in the immediate area. When he was sure he was alone, he clicked the lock on the sliding door and dragged it open. After about eighteen inches, it snagged and he noticed a chain along the ground. Looks like it's secured with a padlock, he reported. Mateo bent down to unlatch it, taking a knee. Stay down! Calvin suddenly cried from the other side of the opening and raised his weapon through the hole. He fired once, taking out a zombie that had been lumbering out of the shadows. He scanned the area. I don't see anything else. Mateo quickly popped open the lock and tossed it aside, opening the door. Got it, he said, and then clapped Calvin on the shoulder. Thank you, friend. No problem, the sniper replied and he and Zion crossed the threshold. The trio turned towards the main part of the warehouse, staring wide-eyed at pallets and boxes full of goods. Jackpot, Calvin breathed. Zion raised a hand. Clear first, then sharp, he reminded them. The trio moved quickly but carefully through the space, checking every corner of the building and stacks of boxes. As they reached the other side, they all yelled out that they hadn't found anything, and converged together on the far end. Calvin, keep watch on the door while Mateo and I see what we got, Zion instructed. On it, the sniper replied, and headed back off towards the sliding door. Zion studied the labels on the nearest boxes, seeing everything was in Spanish. So, uh, he drawled, you tell me, did we do good? Mateo studied one stack of boxes and then moved on to a few others. Dried beans, he murmured. This one is massa flour. This one is canned tomatoes. At the very least, we should get a few weeks of meals out of these, Zion said. His companion nodded. Without a doubt, he replied. My grandmama grew up dirt poor and knows how to stretch every bean. You're in good hands, my friend. Calvin reached the door and scanned the area, keeping watch on the back lot for movement. There was none, but in the distance he heard a low metallic roar, and his ears perked up. What in the hell is that? he muttered to himself, as the sound grew louder. It soon became clear that there were multiple roars competing with each other for noise. Zion! he called. What is it? Zion asked, heading to the doorway. Something's up, man, Calvin replied. His friend reached him, brow furrowing. Well, what is it? He stopped at the noise and glanced at Mateo with a questioning gaze. Where is it coming from? Mateo asked as he approached. Can't tell, Calvin replied. A moment later, the roar was so loud it was almost deafening. They looked up and their eyes widened at the sight of several tomahawk missiles flying overhead. What the fuck? Calvin screamed. Seconds later, there were several loud, ferocious explosions in the distance, rattling the building. The men shared looks of panic and concern. Several more explosions went off, 
mostly to the north, and Zion pushed the sickening feeling out of his gut to take control. Lock this bitch up tight, we'll come back for it later, he barked. We gotta get back up to Wendy's camp. Calvin slammed the door shut behind them, opening it up just enough so that he could secure the chain inside. After that, they sprinted back around to the truck, hopping in. As Zion fired up the engine, several plumes of smoke rose to the north. Mother of God, what the fuck is going on? Chapter 6 Zion sped towards the camp, seeing huge pillars of smoke rising ahead. His eyes were intense and focused as he seethed with rage. Mateo was nervous, worried about his family in the camp, and Calvin simply sat dumbstruck, staring in every direction, still in shock from the explosions. Jesus Christ, man, it's everywhere, he breathed, seeing several columns of thick smoke around the city. Zion clenched his jaw. I know, he said. Calvin leaned forward to look at the approaching plume, stretching hundreds of feet into the air. What the hell were those things? he demanded. Fucking missiles? Sounded like it, Matteo replied. But from who? Calvin asked. Why? What the fuck? He scrubbed his hands down his face. Zion gripped the steering wheel with white knuckles, punching the gas. His stomach sank lower and lower as they grew closer to the camp. What if the missile had hit it? Of course, even if it didn't, hitting close enough would be just as dangerous as the noise would attract zombies towards whatever damage was done. They were still a few miles away when they came around a bend, and Zion slammed on the brakes, skidding to a stop in front of a horde easily several hundred zombies strong. They shambled in the direction of the camp. Now what? Calvin cried. Zion revved the engine several times, staring straight ahead. Buckle up, he demanded. Calvin swallowed hard. Oh, shit, he muttered, and then squeezed up against the door. He motioned for Matteo to get closer to him. He did, and Calvin managed to buckle the seatbelt around both of them. Zion clicked his own belt on and then gunned it, tires squealing as the truck peeled out. As he picked up speed, he drifted to the right side of the road, getting into the shoulder where the zombies weren't as thick. The first creature smacked hard, flying off into the horde and vanishing as it fell into the sea. Several more cracked off of the front of the vehicle, jostling everyone inside. As the horde thickened, Zion drove almost completely off of the road into the grass. Tree branches bounced off of the right side of the truck while zombies bounced off of the left. The constant sound of wood and bone crunching against the truck was sickening and damaging to the truck. Numerous cracks appeared in the windshield, blood and leaves sticking to it. Zion didn't let up, speeding even faster. The front passenger tire hit a deep divot in the grass, sending the right side lurching up. Matteo and Calvin held on for dear life as Zion gave the gas one more push. As they approached the other side of the horde, he steered back onto the road, ploughing through another batch of creatures as he broke through, leaving them in the dust. Calvin whirled around and looked back at the horde they'd just broken through, lumbering after them, arms outstretched. How close are we? he asked. A mile at most, Zion replied. That gives us what? Calvin stammered. Thirty minutes at most before those things get here? Zion nodded firmly, not taking his eyes off of the road. Then you'd better start coming up with a plan. What the hell are you gonna do? the sniper demanded. Destroy. Zion replied. He made a hard right turn onto the road where Wendy's camp was. As he approached, his chest tightened as he saw a missile had landed a block away from the edge of the gate. The impact had ripped through the fencing, creating a gaping hole where several zombies were already working their way through. Gunshots filled the air in the distance, popping off one right after the other. The trio sat in stunned silence for a moment before Zion snapped back to action and punched the gas again. The truck made it up to speed quickly, heading straight for the hole in the gate. Calvin gripped the handle above his head to brace for impact as the vehicle hit some debris just short of it. They launched slightly into the air, crashing through the handful of zombies at chest level, demolishing them. They skidded into the heart of the camp, four square blocks of utter chaos. 
Debris was everywhere, a house on fire in the corner, several people trying to escape from the second floor. Bodies littered the ground, indiscernible between zombies or civilians who'd been near the blast. Then a terrifying sight sprinted towards them. A runner. A freshly minted zombie tore across the street, heading towards the burning house. Without hesitating, Calvin unbuckled himself and dove from the car, slinging his rifle into position in a fluid motion. He raised it and looked through the scope, tracking the sprinting monster as it grew closer to its roasting dinner. A split second later, he squeezed the trigger and the ghoul's head exploded. The creature flopped to the ground, sliding to a stop a few feet away from two people escaping the house. The gunshot startled them, and they whirled around to see Calvin, who waved at them. Get in! Zion barked. We gotta find Monique! Calvin jumped into the back, getting situated and standing against the back of the cab, smacking the roof to let him know he was ready to go. Please, can we go to my family? Mateo pleaded. Zion nodded. They'll probably be in the same place, he replied, and hit the gas. They tore off down the road towards the family house, one block up and over. As they came to the first intersection, they saw that the chaos wasn't just relegated to the front entrance. There were several runners roaming the area, chasing down people and responding to any noise. Gunshots rattled in the distance at a panicked pace. Zion sat for a moment, letting Calvin pop off a shot, taking out a runner. After the sniper smacked the roof again, Zion sped off towards the house. When they got there, several zombies were clustered out front, slapping and clawing at the door. Calvin aimed, but Zion honked the horn to get him to stop. The two men jumped out of the cab. Zion turned to the sniper. Cover our six, we got this, he barked, and Calvin nodded, turning to survey the area, waiting for zombies to emerge from any direction. The honking had alerted the four ghouls from the porch, and they turned shambling down the stairs. Zion's brow furrowed. They're not runners, he said. Which means there's another breach somewhere, Matteo added, eyes wide. Zion clutched his weapon tightly, readying himself to strike. One problem at a time. He rushed forward, swinging his blunt weapon over his head, crumpling a teenage zombie into a heap. Matteo stepped past him with his dual blades, delivering a series of precise strikes that incapacitated two creatures. Zion gave another vicious swing, sending the final ghoul to the ground. Matteo rushed to the door, banging on it and yelling in Spanish. After several tense moments, the deadbolt clicked open and a middle-aged, heavy-set woman appeared. They embraced tightly, exchanging rapid dialogue in Spanish. Ask her where Monique and Wendy are, Zion demanded. After a quick exchange, Mateo turned to him. She says they ran off to the main gate. Come on, we gotta get over there, Zion replied. Mateo tried to break away from his mother's grip, but she held on tight. He leaned back in, saying something urgently and she began to cry, but let go of him. She disappeared back inside and bolted the door shut. We have to hurry, Matteo gushed as they trotted down the steps. Zion threw himself back into the truck. What did you say to her? he asked. That I'm not her little boy anymore, and I'll be okay, his passenger replied as he slammed the door. People need my help. Hate to break it to you, Zion said, but no matter how old or big you get, You'll always be some lady's little boy or brother. Mateo smiled thinly, and Calvin squeezed off another round before ducking and looking in the back window. Where are they? he asked. Main gate, Zion replied as the gunfire continued to increase in the distance. Calvin went pale and took a knee. Shit, that can't be good. Chapter 7 Zion made the turn onto the outer road of the camp, speeding towards the main gate. As they approached, they witnessed a frantic scene. Eight guards perched up on makeshift platforms made of cars and dumpsters, frantically shooting, aiming at targets perilously close to the gate. Several people on the ground stood directly in front of the gate, swaying under the pressure from the zombies on the other side of it. Others used whatever they could to reinforce the fence, some holding tree branches, one holding a twisted car bumper. A few others used knives and machetes to strike the creatures reaching through. 
Dozens of arms stretched out, grasping at the people who darted forward to deliver strikes before jumping back to relative safety. As Zion pulled the truck up just short of the gate, one of the stabbers, a young woman in her twenties, managed to take out a ghoul, but another grasped her wrist in a death grip. She screamed for help, but it was drowned out in the noises of the fray. Mateo spotted her and lunged forward, bringing his cleaver down hard on the ghoul's forearm, severing it completely. The woman staggered backwards, shaking the severed limb from her wrist and falling to the ground. Mateo quickly helped her up, and she stared at him with wide, panicked eyes. You're okay now, you're okay, he assured her, and she finally took a deep breath, nodding jerkily. Thank you, she replied, and then headed off to find another weapon. The top right hinge on the gate cracked open, breaking away from the frame. Right side, sight side, Wendy barked from her position at the fence. The top began to lean and buckle, and the man holding the car bumper shifted to the side, trying to hold it up. As he struggled with it, Zion darted up, taking the makeshift support and jamming it up into position, putting his weight into it to briefly stabilize the barrier. As he held it in place, he stared through the fence, swallowing hard at the couple hundred ghouls pressed up against it. Zion, thank God you're here, Wendy gushed as she joined him. Where's Monica? he demanded. The redhead jerked her thumb over her shoulder. She's with a couple others checking the perimeter, she said. Calvin approached, his face white as a sheet as he surveyed the sea of zombies on the other side of the gate. Where the hell did they come from? he breathed. When that bomb went off next door, Wendy explained, it alerted every fucking thing in a ten-mile radius. Are they from the bridge? Zion asked. She shook her head. I don't think so she replied, and took a deep breath. We gotta send somebody down there. We have to know what we're up against. Zion and Calvin shared a look, and the former said, There's hundreds more coming up from the south, too. Wendy's expression changed from determined to defeated, and she stared at the sky for a moment before clenching her jaw and snapping back into alpha mode. Jackie! Stevie! She barked at a few of the shooters on the wall. Get to the south wall and start patching it up. Grab whoever and whatever you need to make it happen, and hurry up, because we're on the clock. The men leapt down and hurried off, and the redhead turned to Zion and Calvin. We still need to know what's coming on the bridge, she said. The sniper glanced over at Matteo, stabbing wildly through the gate. Matteo, you're with me, he called. The butcher downed one more creature before stepping away from the line and heading over. Go out, see what you can see and report back, Wendy said. No, Zion said firmly. She jutted out her chin, glaring at him. No? If there are zombies on the bridge, we need to find a way to slow them down, he replied. Calvin scratched the back of his head. How do you propose we do that? Burn them, Zion replied. Wendy shook her head furiously. No, 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 she insisted. We need the gas that's in those cars if we're going to be able to- Wendy, Zion cut in. I know you don't want to hear this but we need to get people out of this camp, and now. Her eyes went wild, and she pointed a finger at him. No! she yelled. This is our home, and I'm not going to abandon it. Look around! Zion yelled back, waving his free arm. We can barely hold this group back, and we have a fucking gate. What do you think is going to happen if zombies from the bridge join them, or the hundreds that are about to come through the hole in the wall on the other side of town? She screwed her fists into her eyes for a moment. Fuck, 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 she snapped, but she knew that he was right. She pulled out her walkie-talkie. Monique, come in, she said, defeat in her voice. What's up, came the reply. Wendy took a deep breath. What's your status? Two blocks up on the western wall, Monique reported. Found a hole caused by some debris, so we're patching it up. Keep it open, the redhead instructed. I'm sending some people your way. My brother get back? Monique asked. Wendy nodded. Yep. Feel safer already, the other woman came back. We'll be waiting. The redhead pocketed her radio and raised her chin. What do you need? Calvin and Mateo shared a glance and then the latter spoke up. I need a lighter and a shirt or rag or something. And we need to know how far down to go before we find a car with gas left in the tank, Calvin added. Wendy turned and shoved two fingers in her mouth, 
letting out a sharp, loud whistle. One of the gunmen jumped down from the wall and trotted up to her like a trained dog. Yes, ma'am, he asked. She motioned to him. Give Mateo here your lighter, she instructed, and your shirt. The man didn't miss a beat, peeling off his stained t-shirt and handing it over to Mateo with his lighter. Anything else? he asked. Do you recall how far you have made it on the bridge getting gas? she asked. The man nodded. Yes, ma'am, he replied. We left a pizza delivery sign on top of the last car we drained. So we need to go past it? Mateo asked. The gunman nodded again. Yep, the next one up should be full, he said. Thank you, Wendy cut in. Now get back to the fire line. He turned quickly and rushed back up to his post to resume shooting, now shirtless. If you boys are good, get going, the redhead urged. The duo glanced at each other and then tore off in a sprint towards the hole in the wall. Wendy turned to Zion. We have to figure out how to get these people out of here, she said firmly. I only have enough vehicles to get a little more than half of them out. He motioned for one of the nearby stabbers to come take his spot holding the gate up. Once he was sure it was secure, he stepped away and faced her. Then we need more vehicles, he said. How many more do we need? Five? Maybe six if they're big? she replied. He pursed his lips for a moment. What if we get the shuttle buses from the park and ride a few blocks over? She sighed. Assuming that bomb didn't destroy it, she muttered. That's a chance we're going to have to take, Zion replied. Wendy turned and whistled at the fence crew. Joan, I need you to start getting people from the houses to the center of town, she barked. Use my house as the base, then get every vehicle you can over there. The young woman that Matteo had saved nodded from the fence and turned to head off. And watch yourself, Zion called. We've seen some runners. Joan swallowed hard, face terrified, but nodded firmly and rushed off. It's close enough that we can get to the park and ride on foot, right? He asked, turning back to Wendy. The redhead nodded. Just a few blocks. Yo, shirtless dude, Zion called to the half-naked gunman. Get my truck in front of the gate. That should hold them off. The man nodded and hopped down, getting to work as Zion and Wendy broke away from the gate. She waved for him to follow her. Let's go. Chapter 8 Calvin and Matteo tore down the street, looking to the west for the hole in the fence. The latter was the first to skid to stop as he spotted Monique and two others standing guard. Hey guys, Monique greeted as they jogged over. How bad is it up there? Calvin shook his head. Real bad, he admitted. How's it looking on the street? Looks clear at the moment, she replied. Everything that's coming up joins up with the horde at the gate. He nodded. Watch yourself on the south, he advised. We have another horde coming up, maybe twenty minutes away if we're lucky. She wrung her hands. This isn't looking good, is it? She asked. It's not, he admitted. Zion and Wendy are getting transportation to evacuate. Monique blinked at him, stunned. She knew that if Wendy was giving up the camp, it showed how serious the situation was. The redhead was not so easily swayed. You two better get going then, she said, snapping back into action. She pointed out the hole. Cut through the yard across the street, go up a couple blocks and then go over to the main road at the bridge. Should keep you out of trouble. Calvin rubbed his forehead and offered her a reassuring smile. Might be the first time I've ever avoided trouble in my life, he said. Explains why you and my little brother get along so well, she quipped, and they shared a quick chuckle. She squeezed his shoulder and then the duo hopped through the hole. They darted across the street, reaching the first house and moving slowly along the wall to the corner. Calvin peered around it, seeing a few creatures about forty yards up near the road wandering towards the noise at the gate. The sniper tapped his companion on the arm, motioning for him to follow across the street to the next house. As they reached the corner, Calvin looked to the left, seeing a couple of creatures lumbering towards them. Mateo, he murmured. His partner stepped up, cleaving the side of one ghoul's skull before quickly stabbing the other one in the face. As quickly as it had begun, the fight was over and they were both down, without a single peep or snarl. Calvin blinked with appreciation. We live through this, he said, and you're going to have to teach me how to do that. With pleasure, Matteo replied with a grin. Just don't ask for my grandmother's tamale recipe. Calvin scoffed. 
Shit, man. I'd be like a teenage boy with a porn star, he said. Wouldn't know what to do with it even if I had it. They reached the next corner and peered down the road, seeing several zombies coming up from the bridge. Hope we're not too late, Calvin murmured. He crept across to the next street and into the yard, coming up to the next house. They did a quick sweep, not seeing any zombies in the immediate area. Across the street was a dead end, thick woods that would eventually lead to the river. The two took a deep breath in tandem, simultaneously hoping that the coast would be clear to the bridge. They broke out from cover and ran up the road, staying just off of it on the grass, hoping to muffle their footsteps. As they approached the main road, they ducked down behind a tree as another group of a dozen or so zombies lumbered past towards the camp. They stayed silent, hoping and praying that nothing else followed them. Luckily, once the lumbering throng moved out of their line of sight, nothing else appeared to be following them. They rushed out onto the main road, pausing at the corner to scan the area. To the right, towards the camp, were several groups of zombies moving up, attracted by the noise. To the left, it was mostly clear to the bridge, where a makeshift blockade of cars kept a lot of creatures at bay. It was about four blocks away, and easily fifteen creatures stood between them at the front edge of the cars. Wendy's camp had tried their best to barricade the bridge using the cars at one point, but it was only minimally successful. There were still some gaps that were filled with sheet metal, but those had been broken through, presumably by some of the horde at the gate. From their vantage point, they couldn't see how many were waiting for them on the bridge. Let's blow past these fuckers, knock them down if you have to, and we'll deal with them on the way back, Calvin whispered. Mateo nodded in agreement, and the sniper looked through his scope towards the bridge. About forty yards past a bread delivery truck in the centre of the road, he spotted the target vehicle with the pizza delivery sign on top. He moved over to let his companion have a look. That's your target, he said quietly. I'm going to get up on that delivery truck and provide you cover. You get in there, light it up, and get the fuck out. You with me? Mateo gave him a thumbs up, and they readied themselves to spring. The duo darted out into the road, running full speed ahead towards the bridge, and the zombies standing in their way. They split up, each taking one side of the road, ducking and running past the creatures that clumsily reached out for them. Calvin approached two of the ghouls near the delivery truck and lowered his shoulder, plowing into one of them, sending it to the ground. He used the butt of his rifle to smash the second one in the face, and when it fell he leapt onto the trunk of a sedan next to his target. He clambered up onto the roof and threw his rifle over his shoulder, jumping and grabbing the top of the delivery truck. He struggled to pull himself up, but with a heaving groan, managed to haul his body on top of the truck. He didn't waste any time dropping a knee, drawing his weapon and refocusing on the pizza sign. As he scanned, he saw three zombies huddled around the car, so he took careful aim and fired. One by one, the creature's heads exploded, splattering nearby windshields with crimson goo. After taking out the immediate threat, he looked past the vehicle, and his blood ran cold. Mother of God, he breathed. Between the bomb going off and the constant stream of gunshots, thousands of zombies had been attracted to the noise. Slowly, they navigated their way across the densely packed bridge, breaking through the makeshift barricades just from their sheer numbers. The weight of their mass was too great. The front edge of the horde was close to thirty yards from the target car. Calvin immediately took aim at one of the lead creatures, hoping that if he dropped enough of the rotted undead they'd stumble upon their brethren and buy Mateo precious seconds. You're gonna have to haul ass, brother, he muttered to himself. Meanwhile, Mateo did just that. He ran as hard as he could towards the delivery car, picking one of the center aisles and pumping his legs. He could hear Calvin firing at a rapid pace, and the situation worried him. Oh God, what am I running into? he thought, and managed to push himself even harder. As he reached within twenty yards of the car, several zombies emerged from behind a truck, cutting over from another aisle. Rather than waste time fighting them, Mateo climbed up onto the hood of the next car, running over the top of the vehicles. Calvin saw this and readjusted his sights to focus on the new threat that had caused the change in course. He quickly took aim, firing several times and taking out the creatures that had surprised his companion. He paused quickly to reload as fast as his fingers would work. 
Don't worry, brother. I'll have you covered, he thought frantically. Mateo ran over the cars, keeping his focus on the delivery vehicle ahead. The higher vantage point gave him a view of the mass of ghouls in the distance, which terrified him. He didn't stop moving, though, pushing forward until he reached his target. As he leapt down beside the delivery vehicle, he rushed up to the car just in front of it, a late model luxury sedan. He did a quick check around it, making sure he was alone, at least for the time being, before concentrating on the gas tank. Shots continued to ring out over his head, but he didn't waste time looking up to see how close they were getting. He knew he needed to trust Calvin to cover him. He glanced on the driver's side, seeing no gas tank, and then rushed around to the other side, relieved to see the tank door flush against the body of the car. That meant it was likely it still had fuel inside. Matteo ran over and pried at the flap, but it was latched tight. He jammed the tip of his long blade into the locking mechanism, but it was no use. It didn't budge. Time to get tough on you, he growled and reared back with his cleaver, slamming it as hard as he could into the center of the flap, slicing it right in two. He pried both halves off and revealed the gas cap, which he quickly unscrewed and threw aside. He was unable to stop himself from pausing and glancing at the coming horde as the gunfire ceased, seeing that the zombies were only about twenty yards from him. He froze for a moment in fear, but snapped back to the moment as Calvin resumed firing, presumably having reloaded. Matteo quickly pulled out the shirt and stuffed it as far down into the gas tank as he could. He pulled out the lighter and flicked it several times until a flame was born. He lit the shirt, pausing for a second to make sure it took root. When it began to blaze, he took off like a shot back towards Calvin. The sniper shifted his aim towards his companion's escape, scanning the area between him and the running man. When he didn't see any stragglers, he turned his attention towards their escape seeing about twenty creatures had begun making their way towards the bridge. Rather than focus on the closest creatures, he aimed towards groups that were clustered together. He fired several shots into them, thinning them to the point where two running humans could break through if they needed to. After several shots, he was forced to reload, and Matteo banged on the side of the large vehicle. Come on! Let's get out of here! he yelled. Kelvin slammed in a few more bullets before hopping down onto the car next to him and hitting the road. As he gathered himself, Matteo lunged at a few close-by zombies and carved them up with his blades. With the immediate threat cleared, the two men ran back towards the camp, darting and weaving around the ghouls they dodged on the way in. It didn't take long for them to get clear of the creatures and back to the first road. They stopped in the middle of Main Street, clear of any undead for at least twenty yards. They looked back at the bridge, chests heaving from the hard running. Do you think you got it good enough? Calvin huffed. Matteo nodded. If that shirt was any deeper in there, I wouldn't have had anything to light, he replied. They stood for another moment, and then the telltale boom of an exploding car went off in the distance. A fireball shot into the sky, sending flaming liquid spreading in every direction on the bridge. They exchanged a relieved fist bump. With any luck, a few more cars will catch fire, Calvin said with a grin. Matteo nodded. At a minimum, though, we brought everyone a few extra minutes. Come on, let's get back, the sniper said, breaking into a jog. Pretty sure we don't want to miss the last bus out of town. Chapter 9 Zion and Wendy exited out of the south hole in the wall walking past the two men she'd sent to patch it up. They seemed to be struggling to find stuff big enough to make much of a difference. Forget trying to patch it up, Wendy barked. Just focus on clearing the debris right in front of it so we can get through, and shoot anything that gets within fifty yards of the hole. You got it? The two men nodded and immediately went to work moving the debris that Zion had jumped with his truck earlier. They moved at a brisk jog, knowing their time was short. You really got your people whipped into shape. Zion said as they moved, eyes scanning for ghouls all the while. Wendy chuckled gruffly. Years of being a fitness instructor paying off, she replied. Nothing like getting paid to yell at people, am I right? You are correct, ma'am, Zion replied as they ran down a few more blocks. They looked side to side down the streets as they went, seeing several zombies emerging from the neighborhood. 
They were slow moving and far enough away that they didn't pose any immediate threat. When they reached the corner of the park and ride lot, they saw a few of the shuttle buses in the distance, parked across from the main office building. Dozens of zombies had poured into the lot, seemingly attracted by the noise of the camp. Best guess is that the keys are in the building, Wendy said. Zion nodded. If not, I can hotwire those vehicles, but I'll need some time, he admitted. We'll give it two minutes inside, she said in her no-nonsense tone, and if we can't find the keys, we'll go that route. He gave her a little salute. So, how do you want to play the zombies in the lot? he asked. She looked over his massive wooden weapon, which still sported bits of brain and blood all over the business end. Guessing you're pretty handy with that thing? she asked. Zion grinned. Hundreds of crushed skulls can't be wrong, he replied with a smirk. In that case, if you want to hold them off, I'll get the keys, the redhead suggested. He winked at her, giving his weapon a swing. Let's do this, he replied, excited at getting to crack more zombie heads. The two of them raced towards the small building on the other side of the lot, Zion taking the lead. He ran up to the first corpse, a middle-aged-looking man in a tattered and bloody business suit. He swung hard, sending the zombie careening into a nearby car, crumpling to the ground with a wet smack. There were several rows of cars parked closely together, a throng of creatures in the aisles. Run over the cars, I'll handle them, he suggested, and Wendy nodded, clambering up onto the first car she saw and darting over the tops of them. Some of the creatures reached up in vain, drawn by her footfalls on the fiberglass, giving Zion an easy time in dispatching them while they were distracted. With a single blow, he caved in the heads of two ghouls, crushing them against the top of a sedan. He looked up the aisle, seeing six more monsters lumbering his way. The moans grew in strength as zombies from the flanking aisles came his way, attracted by the noise of their comrades being crushed. Zion rushed towards the six in front of him, using his blunt weapon like a jousting lance. The front edge cracked the sternum of the lead zombie as he drove it back into the others. With three creatures on the ground, he quickly delivered an overhead strike, killing one. He quickly whipped around when he heard moans coming from behind him, seeing zombies coming in between cars from the other two neighboring aisles. He ran back, swinging his weapon like a bat, smashing the face of the creature on the left before spinning around with the weapon held high to avoid the tops of the cars and bringing it down with vicious force onto the next one. With zombies pouring into his aisle, he hopped up onto the hood of a car. As he scrambled, a zombie grabbed his ankle, and he kicked back with his free leg to deliver a heel strike to the creature's nose. The sound of snapping bone was loud, but didn't free him from the death grip. So he punted the corpse again. Finally, the zombie's skull cracked, and he rested his leg free from the defeated ghoul. He looked around as he sprung up onto the roof of the car, seeing zombies coming at him from all angles. With a wild grin, he began to play whacker zombie bringing his weapon down hard with gleeful overhead strikes. One after another, the zombie heads smashed, bodies crumpling all around the car. The mass of ghouls grew so thick that the vehicle began to sway back and forth, causing Zion to widen his stance to regain his footing. He stepped back onto the trunk and leapt over outstretched rotting arms, whirling with his weapon on the downswing to catch a creature in the side of the head. He looked back and spotted creatures heading into the lot from the neighborhood, heading towards the door of the building. Shit, he muttered, and then glanced back at the twenty or so left around the vehicles he'd been whacking. He shook his head in frustration, knowing he didn't have time to deal with them at the moment. He hopped down from the car into the aisle, a foot away from the group, and ran as hard as he could towards the building. As he reached the end of the aisle within fifteen yards, the leader of the neighborhood zombies was almost at the door. Zion raised his weapon to shoulder height, straight out so it led with the blunt end. He rammed it into the side of the ghoul's head, crushing it against the wall, sending a splatter of blood against the brick. He turned to the next creature, swinging like a baseball bat, severing its head from its body to sail back towards the cars. The zombie conga line branched out a bit, going from single file to three or four wide in spots. He swung wildly, taking out a few more zombies, killing another, and knocking one to the ground. He glanced back at the group he'd run away from, only to find that they'd begun to follow him, thirty yards and closing. Wendy! 
Zion yelled into the door. You gotta hurry the fuck up! Inside, the redhead heard him and ran around the desk, narrowly avoiding a grasping zombie. She stumbled over the corpse of the first one she'd put down just seconds earlier. Don't worry, she declared as she grabbed a glass paperweight from the desk. I got something for you too, just like your friend here. She lunged forward and smashed the paperweight onto the zombie's forehead. The glass cracked, as did the skull as she hit it a few more times for good measure. After the third strike, it fell to the ground, and she tossed the bloodied instrument to the side. Chest heaving, she looked around at the four ghouls she'd put down before staring as Zion bellowed in the door again. You've got fifteen seconds before we have to go! The timeline frightened Wendy, who quickly began looking on the desk, throwing papers around to find the two sets of keys she'd dropped during her zombie encounter. With the rings finally secure in her fist, she raced to the front door, skidding to a stop at what had her companions so worked up. Straight ahead, a horde in the aisle quickly gained on them. There was a sickening crack to her left, prompting her to look over and see Zion delivering another skull-cracking blow. He glanced over his shoulder and spotted her. Finally, he said. She jingled the key rings. Sorry, had company. Same here he replied, putting his weapon in lance mode and ramming it into the chest of the next zombie, driving it back into the ten or so remaining creatures. He thrust hard, knocking several of them to the ground before darting back to Wendy. Follow me, she said, and handed him a set of keys before they ran towards the shuttle buses. They were moderately large, enough to hold thirty people comfortably, or forty uncomfortable if need be. They each took a bus, getting inside quickly and closing the doors behind them. Zion sat behind the wheel watching as the zombies staggered to the door, smearing blood on the windows as they tried to get to him. He looked forward when Wendy honked her horn, prompting him to start up his engine. It took a moment for the large vehicle to rumble to life, and they sat there for several seconds, letting the buses warm up from their long slumber. A few moments later, Wendy honked again before popping the vehicle into gear. Zion followed suit, and they slowly rolled out to head off back to camp. Chapter 10 The two vehicles raced down the road towards the camp, at least as fast as buses could go while still navigating the streets. As they came around the last corner, Zion saw that the road horde had arrived at the hole in the wall. The two guards fired as quickly as they could, dropping zombies thirty yards away from the entrance, but it did little to stem the tide. Wendy put the pedal to the metal, gaining speed and honking the horn as she led the charge to the hole. The two gunmen dashed out of the way, allowing the buses to zoom on by. Wendy sped off towards the meeting spot, but Zion screeched to a halt. He dove out and pointed to one of the gunmen. You drive, he barked, pointing at one. You, with me. He pointed to the other one, and then glanced at the man clambering into the bus. And don't leave us behind, he said. The driver nodded and took off, while Zion and the other man stepped out through the hole in the fence, staring down at the hundreds of zombies bearing down on them. Start shooting, Zion bellowed, and the man complied, picking his targets carefully and delivering headshots with his hunting rifle. The lead creatures fall, causing some stumbling but really only buying them mere extra seconds. Zion, meanwhile, looked around the area at the debris the two men had moved out of the way. He eventually focused on a large piece of sheet metal that, if turned sideways, could cover the gap in the fence, but only up to waist height. Help me with this, he yelled. The gunman slung his rifle over his shoulder and rushed over to his companion, and they picked up the large piece of metal together. They pulled it inside the camp, and Zion motioned for him to set it up against the wall. He looked to his new friend. Do you trust me? he asked. The man blinked at him and shrugged. Sure, why not? he replied. Good, Zion declared and pointed to his feet. Lay down on the ground in the middle and press your legs against this. The man blinked at him again, and then it dawned on him what Zion was going to do. You'd better be swinging that thing like a goddamn madman he said, motioning to the wooden weapon. Oh, you ain't gotta worry about that, Zion assured him. The man begrudgingly laid on his back and pressed as hard as he could against the sheet metal that plugged the gap in the wall. Zion gripped his weapon tightly, watching as the ghouls approached, 
spreading out across the line. Here they come. Get ready, he warned. The man gave a thumbs up as he focused on keeping pressure on the wall with his considerably muscular legs. As soon as the first creature touched their makeshift barricade, Zion brought his weapon down in an overhead strike, dropping it. Then he flew into a flurry of swings, two by four whooshing and cracking and delivering death. The man grunted on the ground as he strained to hold the wall in place, looking up in terror as he saw zombies grasping down at him, fingers coming within inches of his feet on the waist-high wall. Zion rushed to the center, crushing blow after blow to the creatures closest to his partner on the ground. They slumped over to the side, adding weight but also a bit of a corpse barrier to the creatures reaching for the blockade. He looked to his left, seeing that the flimsy material was starting to give way on the edge. A creature was able to push its way through, flaying the rotted flesh from its legs as it did. He rushed over and smashed its face in, and then dropped his weapon, grabbing the slumped corpse by the shirt and belt and flinging it into the crowd, hoping to trip up some of the creatures and relieve the pressure on the wall. As soon as he picked up his weapon, a few zombies began to push through on the right. His stomach sank, knowing his plan was busted. The man on the ground saw the incoming ghouls and began to scream incoherently. Zion rushed over and gave the first zombie a hard shoulder hit before kicking the other one back. He tossed his weapon down the street away from the wall before running over to the man on the ground. Get ready to run, he cried, and wrapped his hand around the gunman's collar. He dragged him back with a hard jerk, using every bit of his strength to get him clear of the barrier as it collapsed under the zombies. He yanked him to his feet and shoved him forward, and the two of them ran full tilt from the throng of ghouls. Zion grabbed his weapon as he passed it, and they skidded to a stop twenty yards away to glance back at the horde pouring into the camp. Where's the meeting spot? Zion asked. The man pointed. Two blocks over, he replied. Let's move then, Zion said and took off running in the direction indicated. They ran down a side street, zombies in lumbering pursuit. As they came to the second intersection, they saw the two transport vehicles loading up, as well as several trucks with armed men standing guard. Zion looked around, seeing Calvin and Mateo having returned and let out a sharp whistle to get their attention. He waved and then jogged over to Wendy and Monique. We need to leave, he demanded. The redhead nodded tersely. We're almost there. So are those things, Zion urged. She nodded and ran back towards the house, pointing at a few guards in the process that followed her. A few moments later, some of the guards began firing in multiple directions. Zion stepped out to the road, looking in the direction of the main gate, and saw dozens of creatures coming around the corner. Just up the side road he'd come down, the group he'd tried to hold off from the hole in the fence was already working their way towards them. Monique approached, patting his shoulder affectionately. Don't worry, little brother, she said gently. We will rebuild this place. I know, he growled. Just pisses me off that we're losing all this hard work because some dumbass military bastard decided to launch a couple missiles our way. He clenched his fists. She swallowed hard at the look in his eyes, the anger brewing within him. He'd already had to deal with rogue military elements when the apocalypse had begun. She leaned over and hugged his shoulders, talking softly into his ear. Stay calm, little brother, she cooed. Still a lot to get done today. Her voice calmed him and he took a deep breath, knowing that she was right. They still had to get these people out and to the safety of the apartment complex. At least, he hoped that was still a viable plan. Thanks, sis, he said, and patted her hands. She let go, and they turned to see Wendy and her guards carrying an elderly woman from the house and into the transport. This is the last of them, the redhead barked. Let's roll. She raised a hand and whirled it above her head. Calvin and Mateo approached Zion and the trio jumped into their truck that someone had pulled away from the front gate. Calvin patted the passenger door as he got in. This thing is gonna need a new paint job, he quipped as he noted the blood and guts all over it. Zion stood up, planting his foot on the driver's seat to gain height so everyone could see him. Follow me out of here, he bellowed, and everyone honked their horns in acknowledgement. He ducked back inside and stared up at the truck doing a 180 in the road and heading for the hole in the wall. Where are we going? Calvin asked. Zion raised his chin. 
Gotta hope that hole in the wall is clear, he said. And if it's not? the sniper asked. Zion just glanced at him while grabbing his seatbelt and fastening it with one hand. Oh, hell, Calvin groaned as he tapped Mateo, squishing over so he could belt them both in. Zion made the turn on a side street before turning on the main road towards the hole in the fence. He was relieved to see that the road was mostly empty, with just a few badly damaged ghouls shambling behind the main horde. The corpses bounced off the front of the truck as they approached the hole, and Zion punched the gas to make sure they cleared the way in case anything was just outside the hole. As they cleared it, he made a left, away from the camp. The road in front was clear, so they paused to let the rest of the caravan get out. He honked his horn before resuming the journey, hitting the gas. Homeward bound, Calvin declared. Zion pursed his lips, anxiety thrumming through him. Assuming it's still there. Chapter 11 Zion led the caravan towards the apartment complex along the interstate. Several zombies dotted the road, but they were spread out enough that they posed no threat. As they drove up, there was a huge plume of smoke in the general direction of the apartment, putting the men on edge. We're still a ways away, Calvin said, hopefully, clutching his knees. It doesn't look like it's that close. Zion took a deep breath. Calvin? I'm just saying, man, the sniper babbled. I can see that look on your face, and... He stopped short at the hard glance from his friend and clamped his mouth shut. As they got close to the exit, an overpass over the road to the complex, and saw a guard standing there that waved them down. Ah, thank the good lord you're back, he gushed as they pulled up. Calm down, man. What's going on? Zion asked, holding up a hand. The guard scrubbed his hands down his face. It's home, man, he cried. One of those bombs got dropped a mile or so past us, and it's drawing a whole mess of these things towards him. How many? Zion asked. The guard shook his head, eyes wide in fear. Hundreds at least, he replied. We were leading a small group up the interstate, some that broke off from that big horde from this morning. When that boom happened... They just stopped paying attention to us and started going up the road. Zion's gaze darkened. Why the hell didn't you do anything? We tried, but this was a group of trainees on their first highway detail, he explained, shaking his head. They were in way over their heads, so I sent the one competent person I had as a runner to go around them in the woods to give the complex time to prepare. And I did the only thing I could, which was stand here and hope to God you came back before it was too late. Zion looked to his passengers. Mateo, this ain't your fight, so don't feel obligated to tag along. You stuck your neck out for my family, Mateo replied firmly. I'm happy to repay the favor. Zion nodded in appreciation and put the truck in park. Hang tight, I'll be right back, he said, and got out. You, come with me, he said to the guard. He led the man to the transport vehicle a few cars back. The door opened and Wendy appeared on the steps. What is it? she asked. Zion motioned to the guard. I need you to take this man with you and head out towards White Salmon, he said. What are you talking about? Her brow furrowed. You're going to backtrack a couple miles to the Interstate 84 connection and head east, Zion continued. It's about 60 miles. When you get there, just ask for fingers. He'll introduce you to the right people. Wendy crossed her arms. Where are you going? she asked. Gotta go save our home, Zion replied. She nodded as the doors shut. As Zion walked back to the truck, the vehicles began to turn around. He saw Monique staring at him from the back window of one of the buses, eyes wide. He gave her a thumbs up, letting her know that it was going to be okay. He hopped back into the truck and popped it into gear, speeding off the exit towards the complex. The cab was silent as they drove, Everyone focused on the shit show they were about to walk into. As they reached the half-mile point, there were zombie stragglers on the road. Zion drifted the truck over just enough to clip them with the edge of the bumper, which, at the very least, crippled them. After hitting five or six, there was a large gap between them and the tail end of the horde. He slammed on the brakes as they came around the bend, a few hundred yards from the complex. They stared in shock at the four to five hundred creatures pressed up against the building, trying to get in. With that weight, Calvin said hoarsely, 
That garage door isn't going to hold for long. Gunshots rang out in the distance, and they looked up to see a few people hanging out of third and fourth story windows, aiming and firing down. What can we do? Matteo asked helplessly. Zion took a deep breath, eyes like steel. I want you to go back and clear those things we hit on the way up, he instructed. Calvin, I want you to start firing. Draw as many of them towards you as possible and get them down the road as far as you can. Man, I only got about fifteen shots left, the sniper replied. Zion shook his head. Doesn't matter. Just use them to draw them to you, he said. We gotta relieve pressure on that gate. Well, once you do, then come save my ass, will you? Calvin asked with a smirk, though it was strained. Don't I always? Zion shot back easily. Matteo slid over as Calvin unbuckled the seatbelt. What are you going to do? Zion cracked his knuckles. I'm going to get in there and help him. Chapter 12 As Matteo walked back to clear the way, Calvin got up in the back of the truck for an elevated view. He looked over at Zion, who had darted into the woods for cover before beginning to fire. He honed in on his first target, squeezing the trigger and blowing its head wide open. He quickly bolted in another round and fired quickly, not really taking the time to aim properly since the goal was noise, not precision. Rapid fire was a great way to draw attention. Yeah, that's right, come and get me, Calvin declared loudly. The noise peeled off several zombies, a dozen or so. He fired a few more times, catching a couple of creatures in the face and neck. By the time he had to reload, there were eighty or so corpses shambling his way, easily one-fifth of the crowd. The leading edge of the group was about twenty yards away from the front of the truck. As he began to hop down, he fired one more shot, in hopes that it will pull a few more. "'That's the best we're gonna get,' he muttered, and jogged down the road, putting some distance between them, while remaining in view. As he did so, Matteo walked back from his mission. "'Route is clear,' he said and then nodded in the direction of the zombie horde. Good turnout. Calvin shook his head. Not as good as it could have been, though, he admitted. Hopefully it's enough. The duo began to walk down the road, whistling and shouting and leading the mass of rotted flesh along behind them. Meanwhile, Zion looked on from the woods, deep in cover and staying silent, pleased with how many they'd been able to draw away from the complex. He stood there, weaponless, looking at the horde in front, pressing on the parking garage door. Once the horde had passed, Zion went on the move, rushing through the woods towards the building while moving away from the horde. As he got close, a straggler lunged out from behind a tree. He grabbed it by the neck without breaking stride, slamming it into another truck, dropping it. Zion ran alongside the wall towards the back, the noise attracting a few creatures from the horde. He glanced over his shoulder as he went, muttering curses to himself for not being quieter. He came around to the back end, past the emergency exit, and over to the first opening in the parking garage. He peeked through and saw the college kids struggling with the Impaler 3000. They had it lined up with some zombies to the right of the door, throwing the switch and taking several out with the rebar bolts. As Jack and Harold struggled to rearm it, Zion let out a whistle. Over here, he called, and Tori whipped around, spotting him, as she got close, he inclined his head back to the door. Emergency exit, he said. She adjusted course and he tore for the emergency door, reaching it just as his pursuers ambled around the corner. He leapt into the air, giving the lead zombie a powerful jump kick to the chest, driving it back into its buddies. Tori opened the door. Glad you're back, she said. Zion rushed inside and slammed the door shut. Me too, he said. We need help. Missy screamed, arms flailing wildly at the garage door, which was beginning to buckle on the right side from the weight pressing up against it. Zion raced over, throwing his entire weight into it. Zack and Harold released the impaler and struck a trio of creatures in the face, the zombies convulsing and falling back as the duo rearmed the weapon. "'Welcome back, Zion,' Jack huffed as he slowly peeled the rebar. "'Thanks,' he replied, as if he wasn't holding up a buckling garage door. I miss anything? Jack aimed the impaler and shrugged. Just an impromptu block party, he replied and fired, taking out two more zombies. It's hard to see from here, 
Tori piped up, pushing her glasses up her nose. How many are out there? Zion cocked his head. A few hundred by the door, another hundred or so chasing Calvin down the road, he replied, and at her concerned look he continued, Don't worry, your boyfriend is fine. There's nothing between him and the interstate. She nodded, glancing at the impaler as it fired off again. How's that thing working? Zion asked. She clenched and unclenched her fists. It's slow, but effective. The door popped a rivet on the left side and the students jumped. Slow ain't gonna cut it, Zion said. Any of you have any bright ideas? The girls shared a look, seeming unsure. Well, spit it out, he urged. Don't care how bad it is. Firebomb, Tori blurted. Zion shook his head. Okay, I stand corrected. That is a bad idea, he replied. We're fucked if the building catches on fire. We can make up some high-powered fire extinguishers in case things get out of control, Missy assured him. Tori nodded. Just need a ton of vinegar and baking soda in some containers, she added. The left side of the door creaked open a little more, and an arm reached in, flailing about. Fuck it. I'm in, Zion grunted. Make it happen. Harold, go with the girls and do what you need to do. He inclined his head sharply. Jack, get on the other side of this door. Everyone sprung into action, the others rushing off as Jack pressed up against the left side of the door to reinforce it a bit. Tori led the trio racing up the stairs, stopping at the second floor where the cafeteria was. Missy, you're on baking soda, she said. Harold, find something we can use for firebombs. I'll get the vinegar. The two followers yelled in the affirmative and burst into the lunchroom. There were a few people cleaning up, apparently trying to keep themselves busy as the battle raged outside, distracting themselves from the carnage. Where's the pantry? Tori demanded. One of the workers pointed to the back room and they ran off towards it, ripping through the shelves to find the goods they needed. Got the baking soda? Missy cried and then spotted several plastic gallon milk containers. And our delivery system! Harold poured over the area looking for something flammable, before finally finding some cheap booze in glass bottles. Firebomb is a go, he declared. How many do we need? Grab as many as you can carry, Tori replied, and he grabbed four, cradling them in his arms. Missy grabbed a stack of dish towels from the counter, and Tori finally found a couple large canisters of vinegar. Got it! Let's move! she cried, and they ran back out, carrying their goods. The workers gazed after them with confusion, but didn't say anything as the trio rushed back to the stairs. They thundered up another flight to the lowest level with the exterior windows, finding the first open apartment facing the horde. There were a few older men shooting out the window that startled as the kids entered. You two, they need help down in the basement, and we need the windows, Tori gushed, setting down the vinegar. One of the men furrowed his brow. Who the hell are you? he demanded. We're scientists, she replied, pushing her glasses up her nose. He scoffed. Does this look like a situation that needs science? He rolled his eyes. The blonde stepped up, eyes blazing. Yeah, it does, she snarled. Now get the fuck down the basement or everyone is going to die. He blinked at her, surprise all over his face, and then glanced at his buddy who shrugged and headed for the door. Missy gaped at her friend with amazement. I've never seen you like that, she breathed. Don't have time to be polite, Tori snapped. Let's get to mixing. The three of them spurred to action, creating the firebombs and makeshift fire extinguishers. When they had everything in order on the coffee table, Tori handed a few extinguishers to Harold. Get these down to Zion and help them out, she instructed. We'll launch some from up here if it starts getting out of control. He nodded and took the jugs running from the room. Missy pulled a lighter from her pocket as Tori lifted one of the Molotov cocktails. They looked out the window at the mass of creatures below, stretching back along the road about forty yards. Where are you thinking? Missy asked. Tori pointed. Figure I will aim towards the back, away from the building, she replied. Let's see how that goes and adjust from there. Before they could throw the first one, the window next to them exploded in gunfire. Tori leaned out the window and spotted an older man aiming a hunting rifle. She waved her arms. Hey, hey, she called. He blinked at her in surprise and then raised an eyebrow. Yes, ma'am, he asked politely. You any good with that? she asked, pointing to the rifle. Oh, yes, ma'am, he replied. She reached back in and grabbed a milk jug, showing it to him. 
If I throw one of these, you think you can hit it? She asked. He shrugged. No different than skeet shooting, he replied. Hang tight, she said. We may need you. She motioned for Missy to go. Her friend nodded and lit up the first Molotov. Tori leaned out the window and underhand tossed the firebomb. It flew through the air, landing about five yards behind the end of the horde. There was an explosion of fire which barely struck the back end. About eight to ten zombies caught fire, slowly engulfing them. Going to have to get riskier, Missy mused. You just be ready with that extinguisher bomb, Tori replied, and readied another Molotov, pitching it out. This time the bottle landed about ten yards deep from the back, shattering on the head of a zombie. Flaming liquid shot out in every direction, coating dozens of corpses. There we go, she exclaimed, punching a fist into the air. The girls watched as the flames engulfed the monsters, the scent of burning, rotted flesh reaching up to the window, causing them to gag a bit. Luckily, the fire stayed localized near the back half of the zombies. As the fire burned, they began to drop to the ground. Okay, one more, Tori said with a deep breath. Going to go near the front this time. She turned to the man in the window. And you, get ready, we may need you. He nodded. Just give the word, he said. She got her Molotov lit and lobbed it about ten yards from the building. It landed and creatures near the front erupted in flame, catching and burning in an outward circle through the ghouls. After a minute or so, the flames grew within a few zombies of the building. Extinguisher, Tori said, and Missy handed one over. Okay, I'm tossing this out near the building, she called to the window man. Hit it when it's about ten feet above the crowd. Can do, he replied. She counted down from three and then dropped it. They watched as it fell and then a shot rang out. The jug exploded, sending extinguisher powder spreading over the front creatures. Almost in an instant, the fire snuffed out. Nice shot, she exclaimed. The three of them stared down at the zombies, easily still a hundred and fifty creatures still standing and pushing forward. How many cocktails we have left? Tori asked. Two, Missy replied. The blonde nodded. Let's thin out the ones in the back a bit more, and let Harold and Jack pick off the stragglers with the impaler, she suggested. Missy flicked her lighter. Let's light them up. Chapter 13 Missy and Tori came downstairs to see Zion trying out the impaler. He lined it up and fired, hitting three creatures in the head, letting out an excited yell in the process. He quickly yanked down the lever, reloading it far faster than Harold and Jack were doing together before rolling it over and firing again. This is so much fun, Zion declared. Can y'all make me a portable version of this? The boys shared a glance. Wheels wouldn't be practical, Harold said. Jack shrugged. Could make it like a steady cam, like they have for films. Like Vasquez's machine gun from Aliens, Harold gushed. Jack nodded vigorously. Exactly what I was thinking. Forget the impaler. Can you just make me one of those guns? Zion cut in. Tori shot them a playfully stern look as he approached. I'm glad you boys are having fun, she said. But can we go help Calvin out before you start coming up with diagrams? Yeah, let's go, Zion replied with a nod. He peeked outside to the horde, seeing about forty or so remaining standing, with some still writhing on the ground. While these two finish off the ones still standing, can you boys get prepped to clear out the burnt ones? He asked, turning to the two gunmen that Tori had sent down. Hunting boots and leg protections. Just spike them and leave them be. We can clean them up tomorrow. The two men nodded and ran off to gear up. Missy, why don't you stay here and keep an eye on the boys? Tori asked, pushing her glasses up her nose. Make sure they don't get into any trouble. Her friend smiled and nodded, heading for the impaler. Zion led Tori to the emergency exit, snatching up a piece of rebar on the way. Just gonna borrow this, he said. There was some light banging on the emergency door, sounding like just a few hands. Without being asked, Tori walked over to the nearest wall opening and smacked it a few times, yelling out to the creatures. Within a few moments, the banging stopped on the door and the zombies moved over to her, reaching through the opening with excited open mouths. Okay, did my part she said, and Zion cracked a smile and snuck out of the emergency exit. He stepped over the first target and jammed the rebar into the back of its head, 
stabbing the next one through the eye as it turned to him. Tori emerged from the garage carrying a box with a few molotovs and extinguishers. Just like to be prepared, she said. Zion nodded in approval. All right, let's go get your boy, he said with a grin. They came around the side of the building, seeing the smoldering mass of burnt flesh on the far side. Just to be safe, he said quietly. Let's cut through the trees. She nodded. Agreed, she said. Death by barbecued zombie isn't on my list of preferred ways to die. Oh, yeah? he chuckled. What is on your list? Oh, you know, the usual. Tori replied, pushing her glasses up her nose. Death by orgasm? Drowning in a sea of chocolate? Death by stripper? Zion raised an eyebrow. Death by stripper? he asked. What, you want a bunch of Chippendales grinding you to death? Did I say male strippers? she asked. He gaped at her, and she smirked back at him. Oh, yeah, Zion said, shaking his head. My boy Calvin has a live one. She winked at him. Yeah, he does. The two of them made their way to the truck, heading slowly down the street. As they went, they passed several down zombies, dotting the road like it's a trail, so Calvin and Mateo could find their way back to the complex. Looks like we aren't going to have that many to clear out, Tori said. Calvin is doing some work. He's also got our friend Mateo with him, Zion said. We picked him up at Wendy's camp, and he's a madman. She cocked her head. Hope you mean that in a good way. In these times, he replied, absolutely. As they worked their way down the road, they finally caught up with the horde that had dwindled to about forty or so. Zion reached over to honk the horn, but she stopped him. No, keep them bunched up, Tori said, lifting a bottle. Fire will work better. He held out his hand, motioning to the monsters. Have at it, then. She lit up a cocktail and gave it a good heave, sending it right into the center of the horde, fire spreading quickly. Some of the flaming creatures turned and shambled towards her, but Zion stepped up and smacked them down with his wooden bludgeon. As he lifted the bits of flaming flesh sticking to the end of his weapon, a grin spread on his face. This gives me an idea, he said, and turned to her. Think you can whip me up a flaming sword? He asked as he smashed another creature. I don't think it would be the most practical weapon, she admitted, but it'll look cool as hell. Zion winked at her. In that case, I'll only pull it out for special occasions. Consider it officially on the list, she replied. He smacked down the last few zombies and then saw Mateo and Calvin finishing the last few of their group, finally ending the threat. As the two duos approached each other, Tori set down her box and ran to the sniper, throwing her arms around his neck. Mateo shot Zion a playful look, as if offering him a hug too. I don't care how good your grandmother's tamales are, Zion said, holding up a hand. That ain't happening. The quartet broke into a fit of giggles, exhausted and relieved that they'd managed to survive the chaos of the day. How are we looking at the apartments? Calvin asked as Tori stepped back from him. Building is a little singed, she admitted, but other than that, it's secure. He inclined his head to Zion. Think we should radio Wendy and tell them to come back? His companion shook his head. Nah, let them go hang out down there for a bit while we get this place cleaned up, he replied. A sea of burnt corpses isn't exactly the first impression I want to make. Good call, Mateo agreed. As they headed to the truck, they stopped at the sight of two people running towards them. Oh, hell, what now? Calvin groaned. It was Cheryl and Jack, both carrying guns, and out of breath as if they'd sprinted the entire way. Zion, she gasped, skidding to a stop and trying to speak through her gasps. He put out a hand. Slow down, girl, slow down, he said. Now, what's going on? The... She took a deep, ragged breath. The horde on the interstate. His brow furrowed. What about it? It's... She huffed. Turn around. He straightened up. Calvin, Tori, with me, he snapped. Rest of you, get back to the complex and start fortifying that door with anything you can find. What are you going to do? Cheryl asked breathlessly. Figure out how much time we have, Zion replied. She motioned vaguely towards the interstate. Jermaine is still down there keeping an eye on them she said, finally catching her breath. Said he was just short of the tunnel. He sent the rest of the crew back. Zion nodded, and the trio got into the truck. 
He popped the vehicle into gear and peeled out, speeding towards the highway. How many zombies are we talking about? Tori asked, pushing her glasses up her nose. Calvin shook his head. They took past 10,000 this morning, but there's 50 or 60,000 more behind them, he replied. Her face paled and she looked down at her hands. Man, but what if we just stay quiet? Calvin asked hopefully. Won't they just keep walking on the interstate? Zion gripped the steering wheel with white knuckles. They might see the plume of smoke, he explained, or hear the fire burning and come our way. And even if they don't, Tori added, having that many zombies in this area would effectively mean we'd be prisoners in the complex, and we don't have the resources to sit there indefinitely. There was a long silence in the cab. Calvin finally groaned. So, what do we do? he asked. Don't know until we know how much time we have, Zion replied. They raced down the interstate, going several miles before they spotted Jermaine waving them down on the side of the road. Hey! he greeted. Zion jumped out. How's it looking? He shook his head. It's bad, man, he admitted. The tail end of them, or hell, now I guess the front end of them, is about two miles up the road. I don't know what the hell went off, but it hooked every single one of those fuckers. They moving quick? Zion asked. They ain't runners, if that's what you're asking, Jermaine replied. But they're moving at a solid clip. Calvin took a deep breath. How long did it take you to get them from the exit up there? I don't know, five, maybe six hours, came the reply. The sniper groaned. With where they are now, they could be at the crossroads in four hours, he said. Unless we find a way to slow them down, Zion replied. We have the bulk of the components made for the loppers, Tori piped up. We just need the engines. Zion cocked his head. What do you say, Calvin? He asked. Feel like a trip to the mall? I'm so glad you're into engines and not jewelry, Calvin quipped, smiling at the blonde. Make shopping a whole lot easier. She smirked. Wouldn't say no to a necklace. But if we slow them down, then what? Jermaine cut in. Zion clenched his jaw for a long moment. It gives us time to evacuate. The four of them stood there in silence, stunned and saddened, as a chorus of faint moans grew louder and louder in the distance. The End Up next, death is knocking on their door, and Zion has no choice but to answer. In Portland, Part 5